I am going to try to speak a little closer to the microphone. Um, and what we're hoping to do is turn the presentations into an electronic book so they'll be available for more people to read and, 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 and ponder. And we're also recording this conference so you'll have an opportunity to watch the videos online. And we'll include those links on the ECM homepage um, in the very near future. So. I'll, I'll introduce myself. I'm Simran, and um, I teach at KU, as I mentioned earlier. I just want to mention a couple of a couple of other points which I neglected to say earlier. One is um, some of my students are here today, and we are also for any of you who are on Twitter, we're live tweeting and live blogging this event. So there's a feed that's on Twitter right now of what's happening, and that's under the hashtag KU Food. And um, and yes, I mentioned everything about the recording, so um, so thank you again. And what I'd like to talk about today is um, using, I, I use food as a lens through which I teach environmental issues because, and I think that's evidenced by this morning and the fact that y'all are here, it's an incredibly unifying force. Um, and we all eat and we all have complex relationships with food and associations that extend far beyond caloric nourishment. If you go to the next slide. Um, the fundamental question of today is what it means to cultivate and keep the garden. And um, this is a question that I am constantly asking myself in the work that I do. Um, an integral part of how I see the world is through my faith. And I echo what Mary Beth Lynn says here. I'm not sure if you can read the slide. But, but she says, food is part of my spirituality. My garden and kitchen are the places where I am most aware of God's presence as well as the places where I flesh out my beliefs and values. For me, there is a connection between what I eat and how I pray. So if we can go to the next slide. I give thanks for every act of creation that enables my food to get from the farm to my table. Phil um, is the man who provides the eggs. The chickens provide the eggs. Phil brings the eggs to the market where I usually am on a Saturday morning. Bart and Marky have filled my larder with beautiful vegetables and fruits, and Brian Welch is responsible for every piece of meat in my freezer. So for all of them, I give thanks, and I'm grateful that you have the opportunity to hear from all of them today. Oh, we're way too far ahead. Oh, go back. There we go. Strawberries. OK. Well, I want to read this slide to you because I think it's so beautiful, I'm not sure you can see it. Um, this was written by a writer named Allison Luterman, and I think it exemplifies everything, um, every ounce of reason we have to be grateful and to remember always what goes into the creation of our food. Allison says, strawberries are too delicate to be picked by machine. The perfectly ripe ones even bruise at too heavy a human touch. It hits her then that every strawberry she had ever eaten, every piece of fruit, had been picked by calloused human hand. Every piece of toast with jelly represented someone's knees, someone's aching back and hips, someone with a bandana on her wrist to wipe away the sweat. You can go to the next slide. Some of my students are here today, and on the first day of class, I asked them, are you here to learn the answers? And of course, they want to impress me. It's the first day of class, and I need to say, yeah, sure. Yeah. And I said, well, what I hope you'll leave class with at the end of 16 weeks is really good questions. That's what I'd like you to learn. And um, as truth seekers, I invite you to ask yourselves today whether the pursuit of transgenic seeds, including terminator seeds and the patenting of genetically engineered seeds by multinational corporations, honors life and fruitfulness and is an act of godly stewardship. I don't have the answers. I'm here to just implore you along with me to ask really good questions, and together we can seek those answers. In the Bible, we're called upon to be stewards of all God's creation. I think beautifully summed up in the 1983 UCC pronouncement, to understand the world as God's creation is to understand our responsibility as God's stewards and our accountability to God as tenants. This means that faithful human action is always aware of the nature of creation seeking to enhance and not to destroy what has been so richly provided. This means that what humankind produces should be in harmony with the laws that govern the natural order. 
this natural order includes hybrids, like one of my personal favorite fruits, pluots, which is a cross of plum and apricot. And it's developed intentionally, as many of you know, by um, intentionally touching the pistil of an apricot with the pollen of a plum. Hybrid seeds are um, produced by artificially cross-pollinating cross -pollinating plants for the purposes of improving the characteristics of the new hybrid, hybrid plant and are used in both large-scale agriculture and in home gardens. It's how we get seedless grapes. It's how we get grapefruits. Um, hybrids are an extension of control over what a seed will do, but it's a benign process that would occur in nature, and it's what I would call part of God's plan. There's some confusion I'd like to clear up now. I use the term GMOs in the title of my presentation because it's so commonly used, uh, but the hybrids that I just described are genetically modified seeds. The selective breeding has naturally evolved over a long period of time. The seeds in question for me are the ones that have largely been banned in countries ranging from Germany to New Zealand to Sri Lanka, Ireland, France, and Italy. And they're what we think of when we talk about genetically engineered seeds. They are seeds that have been genetically altered using recombinant DNA technology, which means that the DNA molecules from different sources are combined in vitro into one molecule to create a new gene. This DNA is then transferred into an organism which causes modified or novel traits in that organism that wouldn't otherwise appear naturally. They make seeds resistant to pesticides. They make plants resistant to spoilage. They infuse nutrients into foods in which they do not naturally exist. This seed technology is patented, and these seeds are not saved. And this, I feel, is man's plan. The first genetically engineered tomato was called Flavor Saver. It was created by the California-based company Calgene in 1992 and it received FDA approval in 1994 to have a longer shelf life. Um, currently, there are no genetically modified tomatoes available commercially, but scientists are developing tomatoes with new traits like increased resistance to pests or environmental stresses. An early tomato um, was developed that contained an antifreeze gene um, from the winter flounder with the aim of increasing the tomato's tolerance to frost. Right? Um, it was known sort of colloquially as the fish tomato. Uh, the resulting tomato was never commercialized because it was called the fish tomato um, because of ethical questions over adding genes from one kingdom to another. And um, this is one of the concerns that I'm, I'm gravely, it's, it's something I'm gravely concerned about. And I want to just back up and say one thing. When I showed you the image of the strawberry and read to you from Alison Luderman, I take very seriously um, the work that goes into creating our food. I'm less concerned about what I think of as an abstract food system. I'm really concerned about how hard it is to farm. And I, I, I stand in awe of those who do it, Nancy Thelman and others, because I, I, I don't have that in me. And that is part of the reason I'm so grateful. So what technologies that make farming easier are not ones that I'm ready to dismiss. I am ready to embrace anything that makes this very hard job a little bit easier and creates increased yields for people who are already working so hard at such thin margins. The way we achieve that, however, is one that I think is incredibly important and what I'd like to keep exploring today. If you can move on to the next slide, thanks, Kim. Um, since 1994, there's been a 94-fold increase in genetically engineered crops. And the uptake, as I mentioned earlier, has not been even. There's very little genetically engineered food in Europe. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, the genetically engineered food crops that are grown um, by U.S. farmers, we are the number one GE, um, we're a GE nation <laughs> in the world. We're the number one genetically engineered um, uh, holding place in the world. Um, the crops that we grow include corn, cotton, soybeans, canola, squash, and papaya in Hawaii. Um, I wish you could see this uptake because it is pretty extraordinary and this is, I don't know, there's some people in this room who very much know what I'm talking about. In our lifetime, we have seen this incredible shift from zero to 93% in the case of soybeans are now genetically modified. So, um, and I, I just, I'll point out a couple others just because you may not be able to see the slide. From zero in 1996 to 78% of our cotton 
um, has one type of genetic modification. Uh, so I would say cumulatively, you could say roughly 78% of our uh, cotton is genetically modified, 63% uh, of our corn is genetically modified, um, and um, currently we're mapping the wheat genome at K-State to also move toward the genetic modification of wheat. There are human trials that are being done on this. Um, actually, some of the crops were destroyed, but the trials are, are progressing in Australia, so the genetic modification of wheat is not far behind. And as the wheat state, I, I, I wish for us to contemplate this deeply before we move forward. Um, all right, another slide I wish y'all could see. <laughs> I will happily provide these to you later. It just, again, details where, um, where GMOs are grown. Um, but what I can say to sum this slide up is 70% of all packaged good in our traditional grocery stores contain genetically modified ingredients, and that's mainly corn and soybeans. If you can move to the next slide, please. Um, if the seeds um, resulted in the reduced use of pesticides, this would be a very good thing. Some estimates um, indicate one-fourth of the world's pesticides are used on one crop, which is cotton. I'm, from, I'm of Indian origin, and um, that is a place where a lot of cotton is grown, and the, the impacts of endosulfan, which is a common pesticide that's used on cotton, is, are horrific for children. The kids who are exposed end up with, on, on the surface, cleft palates, um, neurological damage. There are kids born without limbs. They're um, children who shouldn't have to grow up that way. And um, in large part, it's, re it's a result of the kinds of impacts that they have from exposure to pesticides. I want to talk um, just real quick about one, uh, a couple of studies that were done here in the United States that began in the late 1990s, and they followed children through the age of seven. The, um, there were three studies that were done concurrently by different universities. The UC Berkeley study showed um, pesticide exposures from farm work in more than 300 low-income Mexican-American families in California. That's who they focused on. Um, the chemicals crossed the human placenta, and they worked by inhibiting brain signaling compounds. So the kids who were exposed in the womb to substantial levels of neurotoxic pesticides had lower IQs by the time they entered school. Um, versus children who have virtually no exposure. So it's the visible effects and the invisible effects of these pesticides. Um, in two comparably sized studies in New York City, exposure um, was actually traced to bug spraying in homes or eating treated produce and had similar results. Um, so despite our goal, um, and so, so on the surface what we, would say, what we would think is that genetically engineered foods that would reduce this pesticide usage would be a very good thing. It absolutely would be, but unfortunately, this has not occurred. Um, there is now documented weed resistance to genetically engineered cotton in, in India, as listed on Monsanto's website. Monsanto is the largest, um, they're the largest holder of seeds in the world. They're the largest holder of genetically engineered seeds in the world. 90% uh, of all genetically engineered seeds are owned by this company, this one company. So you'll hear me reference Monsanto, it's just, it's because of the biggest. Um, but Monsanto is now acknowledging the increase of super weeds and super pests that are resistant to the chemicals um, that are being put on the Roundup Ready cotton. So, um, so we're seeing that that didn't quite work out the way we intended it. And those, I, I'm citing cotton in particular because those studies have been acknowledged specifically by Monsanto. You can find that information on their website. There are a number of other studies that are showing weed resistance within the United States, um, but they haven't necessarily been accepted by industry as well as by farmers and by scientists. If you can move on to the next slide. This, um, another common refrain around the need for genetically engineered seeds and foods is that they help feed starving people and they reduce environmental impacts. Um, this is a very real concern globally and right here in Lawrence. And this image is from Just Food. This is an image of their pantry. I wish you could see this. My students here can tell you about this image. Um, just food stocks baby food. Um, and that's um, something that is covered, as Jeremy Farmer can explain later on today, he's the executive director who will be talking about local responses to hunger. Um, but what he explained to my class is that we stock the baby food because when parents are on food stamps and they're having to buy food, they have to buy for the whole family. So what gets prioritized are, is food for the family, not food for the baby and then they try to make that food work for the baby. But what Just Food tries to do is also make sure that food specific to children is available. Um, 